Hi guys, uh, my name is Jean. Uh, I work for Pivotal, and at Pivotal, uh, I consult with a lot of our clients. Um, we see this sort of frequent thing um, where people are approaching the issue of um, deployment, and they're tackling it from many different angles. Um, and sometimes uh, it's tricky. Uh, with Go apps, uh, you're building a lot of microservices frequently, or you might be building a CLI that has to run on lots of different uh, operating systems, um, so like CentOS and, and CoreOS or, or Windows and Mac. Um, and so, uh, again, you have these problems where building a final product um, is tricky. So Go and, and deployment, uh, or the concept of a finished product, is sort of this, this topic that comes up a lot um, for Go developers and for our clients. And so um, I started thinking about this a lot, and recently I've been working on uh, another project called Cloud Foundry. Um, Cloud Foundry is sort of a PaaS that's uh, entire purpose is to make deployments easier. And so I wanted to put together a little presentation that sort of deals with this issue and how can we approach the question of um, let's build a CI CD pipeline. Um, how do we look at the cost and the value and how do we do it properly? Um, so uh, I'd like to bring up kind of one of the, one of the scenarios that comes up a lot. Um, as a starting point, and then we'll kind of approach the problem as if we were starting from the bottom up. Um, so the scenario is, uh, it's a deployment day, and you find yourself logged into a production server, um, one of many nodes, and you need, to, uh, you need to get your app updated to the latest version. So you, you do like a git pull, um, and you go to restart your app, and, um, and oh, uh, the app doesn't start. Oh, that's weird. Um, so uh, that's, that's fine, our company has these scripts that I'm gonna run. Um, so I'm gonna kick one of these off and a couple of these in, um, yeah, some weirdness comes up. Um, so so, so what, is, what is a core dump? Is that something that I want? Is a seg fault good? That's, that doesn't sound too good, does it? Um, okay, uh, okay, I'll, I'll reboot the server. That's probably the best idea. Um, and then try and access the server. Oh God, it's like it's not coming up. Um, so now like panic sets in, right? So the guilt starts setting in, like what have I done? Uh, you start thinking back to the last couple of weeks. You checked your code with a PM on your local computer and everything was fine. Um, okay, fine, uh, when did we deploy last? Oh shit, it was six months ago. That's, that's, that's not good. Um, okay, so now real panic's starting to set in. And as you're thinking about this, uh, you hear this noise in the distance. You hear footsteps, and then uh, out of nowhere, there's like, poof, like your sysadmin comes in. What have you done? You know, like the entire server's down. Um, okay, so this is actually something that we've seen, and and we actually see this pretty frequently. So um, 16 hours later, um, you've been working the whole night uh, trying to fix this thing, and um, you just you're thinking to yourself like, there has to be a better way to do this. There absolutely has to be. Um, okay, so most of you guys are probably pretty familiar with this sort of situation, and, and hopefully you aren't in this situation. Um, but this is a reality for a lot of people. So let's, let's kind of go over what went wrong here. So, um, so there's a couple of things. Uh, so we didn't test our app, uh, whatever, whatever work we've been working on. We didn't test it in a prod-like environment. This is important um, for a number of reasons, but, but obviously we just don't want failures to happen in prod. If something's gonna fail, let's, let's have it fail internally and keep prod stable. There's a long time between deploys, that's six months, means there's a lot of code drift from when we last deployed. And so the longer we go without deploying, the longer there is for changes to break things. Um, so that's dangerous. Uh, we have a Snowflake prod environment. If you are SSH'd into your prod box, you're gonna you're gonna have problems. Uh, is the like the short version? There's there's more opportunity to uh, break things or configure things or whatever. That one prod box is gonna be different than another prod box. Um, if you're working in a microservice environment, uh, you guys are Go developers, so uh, I'm sure many of you are. Then you need to deploy to lots of different instances. Um, and so, yeah, the, the more uh, individual changes to a single VM or, or a box, uh, the more dangerous. 
Um, and then the manual deployment. A single person um, you know, might be the most amazing developer, but you're going to have bad days. You're going to forget things. Um, so automating things is just better. This is why we program, right? Automation is a safer alternative. To tackle some of these, um, there needs to be some prerequisites in place. Um, so, uh, so once we've achieved these prerequisites, our CI system is going to be um, the most effective that it can be. So let's talk about these prerequisites briefly. Um, so no testing in a product-like environment. You need a culture of testing. Um, if you have a, a system that is automatically deploying your code, um, but you never test whether that code works beforehand, uh, that's not going to be uh, effective, right? You could deploy bad code all the time. So a culture of testing at your company is important. Um, if you have a long time between deploys, once again, you have that drift. Six months of drift from the last time you deployed is dangerous. It's really dangerous. Um, so a culture of continuous deployment is um, a great way to mitigate risky deployments. And then for Snowflake product environments and manual deployment, a cloud platform is ideal. It's not required, but it's ideal. Um, so what I've seen before, and, and I'm sure you guys have seen this too, is, um, well, let's just write a bunch of bash to deploy our stuff. Fine, it works, right? But it's not fantastic, it's not tested, it's not a great solution. Someone leaves and then like, what does this do? I have no idea, right? It's just not, it's not the best. A little bit better than that is the IaaS, right? So if you're using EC2 um, or OpenStack or something like that, vSphere, it's a little bit better. Um, now your containerization and virtualization is, is managed for you and you sort of just have to deploy your app. Still not perfect. The very best, and I'm biased because I work on Cloud Foundry and it's a PaaS, but a PaaS is sort of the ideal. You write your code, you give it to whatever your PaaS might be, Elastic, Beanstalk, or whatever, Cloud Foundry, and then it takes your code and it figures out how to run it, uh, it figures out the containerization, and figures it all out for you. So these are the sort of ideal prerequisites um, that your company would have in place for the most effective CI CD server. Okay, so uh, let's talk about what the ideal cycle of our code might be. So if you've heard of this concept of the circle of software or the circle of code, um, this is like an abbreviation of it. This is sort of just the very small terse version of it. So you commit your code, and then hopefully during this commit, you've written the code, you've, you've tested the code as well. The code goes to your CICD server, uh, where it runs all of your tests, it lints it, um, it does go vet, uh, checks race conditions, all of that stuff, and then your CICD server deploys it to your, um, your prod environment, uh, or testing environment, whatever you're comfortable with. Um, and then the cycle repeats itself. There's like lots of different steps in this, in the, in the bigger version, but I think uh, that's kind of the, the condensed version. So in this, we have um, developer working on tests and code, we have confidence in our CI CD server because we've written tests for our code. And then when we go to deploy, we have confidence in the deployment because we use those tests to vet out our program on something that looks like prod. And hopefully that exists with your CI CD server. And then we just repeat that cycle. Let's take a, a brief tangent and talk about tests here. And then we'll look at CI CD servers. So tests, uh, tests is this like pretty deep subject, I would say. Um, you can write a thousand tests for your app and none of them provide you any value. And it's kind of dangerous because you might see this number of code coverage, right? Um, or you might see how many tests have I written per feature. And it's this really, um, like, it fills you with warmth. You feel good about it. You feel good about your app and deploying your app. But it might not be useful. So this is the kind of thing that I think about when I'm writing a test. A unit test is something that is pretty closely tied to your functionality. And it's not going to give you a ton of value. It might drive implementation. And it's certainly something that you should have a lot of um, because it's so cheap, right? Um, but functionality and implementation change pretty frequently. And so your unit test change as well. It's not, it's not, it doesn't describe a feature, right? Um, when you get up, to the higher levels, integration and end-to-end -end tests. So now instead of saying this function works this way, you're saying this feature works, right? Instead of saying 
uh, you know, when when I get this data, I store it into my SQL, blah, 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 blah. You're saying when a user clicks a button, this happens. Uh, these are a lot more expensive. Debugging them, writing them. Um, I mean, think about just writing a UI test. That's far more expensive. Um, but they are way more valuable. If a test fails that says your app works in a certain way, that test is describing a failure in your entire system. It's not describing a tiny little you know, weird edge case. So they're very important. They're a lot more expensive. Smoke tests are the most valuable and the most expensive. Of course, you're testing um, these end-to-end -end tests, these system tests against your actual prod-like environment. You might even be writing tests that say under duress or under stress or when MySQL is down or when Redis is acting weird, then how does my act? app behave. So a lot more value there, also a lot more time and energy and cost. So ideally what you would have is you'd have a lot of this unit test left side over here and you'd have less of the right side, but you have a good mix of these. So if I go back briefly, um, oh sorry this one. So then over here my CI/CD server will manage all of these. My CI/CD server will run my unit tests and my smoke tests. And then when I do get to the stage where I'm ready to deploy, my automation has the sort of building blocks of figuring out whether I can deploy uh, on my unit test screen, did my smoke test run, and so on. OK, so uh, this talk is actually built for sort of more 45 minutes an hour. So I didn't, uh, I kind of cut out the let's, let's actually build one. Um, so we're just going to take a, a couple of look at what's, what's out there. Um, so I like, to, I like to talk to clients about this in the sense of, of scale, first of all. I think that's the most important. When you're looking at a CI CD server, what's your scale? If you're building a small project, there's certain CI systems that are better suited. And if you're building massive pipelines, um, like microservices, then there's other CI CD systems. Um, so let's start at something that hopefully you're all familiar with. Um, Travis CI is kind of where I put one end of the spectrum. Travis CI is a pretty basic CI system. Um, th so this is one repo up there. This is actually the repo for this talk. Um, feel free to you know, PR to it and so on. Um, so every commit, what's happening is um, tests get kicked off. So um, you're seeing there's like 23, number, commit number 23 pass, commit number 22, and so on. And so every single test here, uh, sorry, every single commit here gets run against, um, in this case, it's the go test suite. So just go test gets run. Uh, and then I think they do go vet as well. So Travis CI is fantastic. Um, it's free. If you're a GitHub developer, you can, every single project that you have, you can immediately set up with Travis CI right now. It's really easy to use. Um, in fact, uh, the simplest way to get started with Travis CI, if you haven't already, is just specify the language in a YAML file. Literally, that's it. If you say go, then it's going to, every commit, it's going to take a look at your repo, pull down the code, run go, uh, go vet and go test against it, and then um, start publishing over here. So very easy to get started. If I click into one of these builds, um, any one of these that I have listed here, um, you can also take a look at the information for it. So this is all of the commands that it was run, the output for it. Um, in this case, it passed, but if it had failed, then it'll tell you what the failure was. You can stack trace it, all of that kind of stuff. So this is kind of the entry point, I like to think of it. On the other, like way on the other end of the spectrum is um, Concourse. So Concourse is a, um, it comes out of this idea of, uh, so at Cloud Foundry, we had to we have to build these systems that are massively interdependent. And so, you know, this thing relies on this, and I can't deploy on like this guy's ready, and this guy shouldn't test if this guy isn't ready. And so, like, hugely interconnected pieces. If you're working with microservices, this is probably the world that you live in, too. So, this is um, actually, once again, to be meta, this is the pipeline for Concourse, the Concourse pipeline for Concourse. Um, and so, uh, immediately what you can see here is it's, it's a lot more uh, complicated just to visually parse this. Um, but hopefully, hopefully you kind of see that um, like it's built for, for sort of waves of pipes, right? And so you can define anything that you want in here. It's very open. Um, but you know, where Travis CI is very like, oh, I can look at it and see like here's the list of builds for a single app. This is like... Uh, I don't really know what I'm looking at immediately, but I get the sense that it's, it's, 
it's smart looking or, or complex. Um, so kind of what's happening here, just because it's, it's far for most of you guys, is um, sort of you're, you're starting at like your unit test level over here, um, and then you're running um, sort of wider things over there, and then finally at the end you might deploy different versions of it, is like the long and short of it. If you were to click on any job in here, um, you get kind of similar output to Travis CI. Um, the build numbers are at the top over there, um, duration and all of that stuff, and then here's just tests that we're running. Um, so uh, in, in these pipes, you could define tests. You could also do deployments on the far right over there as deployments. And then um, what's also kind of nice is if you are building a release, uh, the concourse has a concept of, of outputs. And so at the very far end over there, um, you know, concourse builds these binaries. And so the output of like a deploy might not be actually deploying it. It might be I put a binary somewhere, uh, like EC2, or not EC2, the S3 bucket store. Um, so, uh, so like way on the other end of the spectrum. So if I have this kind of this pipeline uh, set up, uh, let's kind of think about how I might uh, organize uh, my pipelines in a way that's efficient. Um, so this is like, this is the intro. I like to think of it. When you start getting to an app that has like these multi-level tests, um, this is what it might look like. This is a simple pipeline. So you commit and it runs unit and integration tests in parallel. Um, this is kind of nice because unit tests uh, might be fast, but integration tests take a while. So it's nice to split things out. And then end-to-end -end tests, and then finally I can deploy it. Uh, in a larger world uh, where you have many microservices, you're gonna do the same thing many times. And then if your whole system is green, um, you know, let's bump the release. That's kind of like uh, a really easy start, I think. If you were doing something like CLI management tools or um, like non-web app sort of things, non-microservices, um, you might have a similar thing, but just instead of deploy, it's like uh, tar it up and put it wherever makes sense. So, uh, so yeah, so let's go back to the kind of spectrum. So if we're looking at, uh, if we're looking at sort of options here, uh, Travis CI, very simple, um, smaller projects. Circle CI and uh, Go CD are great options too. Um, actually, so Concourse came out of Go CD. The problem statement originally was uh, sort of as I mentioned before, um, you know, I want these pipelines and I want to have first class support for managing lots of uh, interdependencies. And um, so Cloud Foundry started at Go CD. And uh, in fact, they have a decent amount of options there at the moment, but um, it sort of split out into this separate thing because Go CD just didn't have like the level of complexity that Cloud Foundry was looking for. Um, so Pivotal's built a uh, concourse and um, it's now open source. It's not really just controlled by us um, at all. It's, it's started open source. Um, so yeah, at the very end of the spectrum is concourse. Jenkins, um, just raise of hands, who uses Jenkins here? Yeah, I thought so. Jenkins is like by far the most popular that we see with clients. Um, it's a fantastic tool. Uh, it's free, as many of you know. Um, there is like a hosted version, but it is free. And um, the problem that I see with Jenkins a lot is uh, until version 2.0, there's no pipeline support at all. Um, version 2.0 kind of fixes that a little bit. Um, the next problem is that um, it's very snowflakey, right? You, you have to uh, set it up and then use the UI to build your pipelines and, and each job has its own, uh, you know, like config that you can set up. Um, if you've kind of dug into it, you might find that you can mess around with XML files. And so you can kind of unsnowflake it by putting your XML file configuration into Puppet or, or Chef maybe, um, or even just Bash if you'd like. Um, but, you know, like people are gonna use the UI all the time. So um, your CI server goes down and then when it comes back up, all of your changes get wiped, right? So um, clients love that one. Um, I think a lot of people should use Jenkins, um, but there's, there's some downsides. Concourse um, is kind of built to not be snowflakey, um, so you cannot make any change except through YAML files. Um, but uh, again, like you should choose what's best for you. Uh, I think Concourse is pretty hectic myself, and so if I were recommending a CI to a client, I would say um, Jenkins is the 
kind of the perfect place to start. It doesn't look like it's in the middle here just because I have some stuff under it, but Jenkins in my head is kind of like right in the middle and then go down or up from Jenkins according to um, what makes sense for you. So um, yeah, so those are, those are uh, pretty good entry options. There's a couple others, Team City um, is a pretty popular one. If you're familiar with JetBrains, um, they make IntelliJ and RubyMine, all those tools. Um, so Team City is nice. Uh, it's very well supported, and it's got great VCS tools. Um, but it's not fantastic for the Go community. Um, so I kind of took it out of this slide. Um, but yeah, these are all great. So uh, the one other thing that I would suggest the Go community especially look out for is um, I suppose that uh, a lot of these tools kind of run on single uh, VMs, so single operating system. Um, if you're looking to do cross-compilation, that's pretty dangerous. Um, we had one client uh, who was building a CLI, and they have been using Jenkins for a while. And in fact, they still use Jenkins. Um, and then, you know, they shipped their product, and the amount of issues that they got regarding, you know, <coughs> trying to use it on different machines is pretty staggering. So that was an unfortunate thing in hindsight. Okay, cool. So we've covered kind of the, the why and we've covered kind of the how uh, and sort of the options out there. Um, I think that I cut a little bit too much because I'm sort of at the end of my talk. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> if you'd like to talk about it, I have a lot of time now for Q&A. Uh, so just come up and um, chat about your use case. Um, let's go over it. If you'd like to start um, building your own pipeline, um, I have lots of resources. This repo um, is where the talk lives. It's also got a, an example Travis file an example program and an example concourse um, like setup guide. Um, so if you'd like to get started with the CI system, this is a decent place to start. There's loads of resources online. Um, like I said, please come talk to me. Um, I'm more than happy to chat with you about your use case or um, you know what, what I've seen out there. So thank you guys, appreciate it.